going to start sharing my screen, Darren and Phil. So hopefully you'll be able to see this shortly. Yep. Yep. We've already got some participants joining. Lovely. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And the participants is flying up. Lovely. Very, very, very. So we will. Um, We'll give it a couple of minutes for those just joining. Um, I think yesterday we had people joining up until about uh, five past. So we'll give it a couple of minutes. Um, but um, yeah, really, really excited. I think we got off to a fantastic start yesterday. Um, we were pretty blown away by the engagement, to be honest. So um, more of the same today, hopefully. I'm glad I'm not on Q&A today because that was uh, very tiring yesterday. <laughs> so uh, good luck, Mr. Phil. For sure. We'll do some intros in a second once uh, once we've got the participants joining. Um, again, kind of same, same process as yesterday. Um, if you've got a question, please jump into chat or Q&A. Uh, just because of the volume of the amount of people that are joining, uh, we won't be unmuting people who raise hands. Um, so again, just jump into chat. Uh, we've got uh, one person spending their whole entire time on chat today. So... I uh, hope there should be lots of engagement happening in that conversation as well. Yeah, and I think we've, we've still got lots of questions from yesterday that we're going to try and get back to people, get answered um, throughout the week, right? Yeah, I mean, we, got, we got over 70 yeah. questions in the end, so I uh, couldn't get around to all of them. So we'll make sure that we, uh, we respond um, to all of them in, in time. But I think in the, in the hour, 70 questions was, uh, was quite miraculous to get. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. For those just joining, don't worry, we've not started today yet. Uh, just uh, just talking about yesterday. Uh, we'll, we'll give it another couple of minutes um, as the participants are still flying up. What was your What was your personal highlight yesterday, Phil? Um, Put you on the spot. Well, <laughs> you all know I struggle with brevity, so to be honest, my personal highlights will come later on when we start getting into the nitty gritty and into the the technical depth. Uh, I think I, I do struggle a little bit to keep things simple, so I'm looking forward to uh, to getting into like the modern software engineering on Friday um, and into the DevOps stuff next week when we can really start to get nice and technical. Nice, nice, nice. I've just seen somebody raise their hands. Um, again, for those just joining, uh, don't worry, we've not started for today yet. Um, if you do have a question, please jump into the chat um, or the Q&A. Um, and it will get answered in there just because of the, the volume of people on, on the call. We won't be unmuting people um, who raise their hands. So please, 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 anything unclear, just dump in the chat um, and, uh, uh, and we'll make sure that we get back to you. Yeah, I think for anything that's to do with like, how will I get access to this, all of that sort of stuff, put it in the chat and I think uh, Daisy will, will get on that. If you've got questions about the technical stuff, the presentation, the stuff that we're actually talking about, Try and get that in the Q and A, and then it just helps us to uh, to respond. Awesome. We'll give it another sixty seconds before we jump into today. I can see the participants is still um, still going up. But, um, but yeah, filling down. You can see my screen, okay? Yep. Yep. Brilliant. Brilliant. So uh, yeah, fingers crossed. No technical issues. Yesterday went swimmingly from a, a technical standpoint. So um, fingers crossed. We we keep that up. We'll be juicing gremlins at some point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool. All right, guys. Well, let's, let's get started. So um, welcome back to day two. Um, those of you that have made it to day two, congratulations. That is no small feat in itself. Um, so, uh, yeah, super thrilled to have you back. Um, on, the, on the session today, um, you've got myself, Mark. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO at HackerJob, and I'll be hosting today's session. And then we've got Darren, um, who heads up our account management function, um, who will be um, leading uh, a lot of the content today. And Phil will be jumping in to give his perspective from a talent side, um, as Phil runs our talent community. That's Phil, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself any further. Uh, no, I think well, I'll touch no, it. I, think. <laughs> I, I, I deal with the, uh, the candidates on the platform, making sure that we've got enough great candidates for our, our, our clients in the key areas and obviously that those candidates have a, um, a great a great experience of using the platform. Uh, one thing I do just want to jump into, we've already had a question on what is the difference between Angular and AngularJS. 
So a lot of these things we will be answering as we go through the, the presentation. Um, so what I would say is when we're explaining something, if you have a question about what we've said, pop it in there. If it's um, something that you know is likely to come up because we are going to go through frameworks, things like that, just try and wait till we, we get through the, uh, the presentation at that point. But great question. and definitely It's a very good first question. I like that a lot. <laughs> it's a question I was anticipating. So Yeah. Brilliant. Cool. So um, let's let's jump in. So um, just a, a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, I think yesterday we were we were blown away by the volume of questions, and we want to make sure um, that we can uh, get back to everybody and actually start some really interesting uh, debates around a lot of this um, technical content that we're going to be covering. So one idea someone in the team had was potentially to set up a Slack group for everybody that attends these sessions, um, where we can go deeper into technical topics. And we can also do some more peer-to-peer -peer interaction because um, as the survey showed yesterday, there are a lot of senior tech recruiters on these sessions uh, and I'm sure they're itching to, to give their opinion on these things. So it might not be a great idea, but we thought um, you know, setting up a, a Slack community could be interesting. So I believe we'll be running a poll within Zoom uh, again now. If you think it'd be valuable to, to have a Slack community to discuss a lot of these topics, uh, please give your opinion uh, and we'll share the results in, in tomorrow's session. Um, the poll has gone wild already. Amazing. Fantastic. Maybe we'll share <laughs> them at, at the end of the session. Um, yeah. So um, Again, uh, when asking questions, um, if you're using the chat, please make it visible to all participants just so that everybody can see what's going on. Um, if you're using the Q&A, then, then use the Q&A. That's fine. Just to repeat, we will not be unmuting people just because of the volume of people on the call. Um, so if you've got a question, please either use the Q&A or the chat. Um, and again, um, for those of you uh, that were here yesterday, you'll know that you're going to be invited to a new Zoom webinar each day. So um, Daisy will send that out this afternoon. If you have any issues, please just let Daisy know. Um, Points being prizes. So uh, the quiz goes on. Uh, yesterday, um, we, again, incredible engagement. We had hundreds of people complete day one of the quiz. It was easy, guys. So if you got 10 out of 10, don't get too excited yet. It's going to get harder. Uh, so there'll be a quiz going live today. Uh, I believe that will get shared into the chat now and we'll also link it at the end. Remember, there's a £500 Amazon gift voucher up for grabs. So, you know, it's a, a, a decent amount for, for any lockdown essentials that you need. Um, and we'll share some leaderboards uh, later this week. Um, and secondly, the, the Hacker Job Wine Club offer is still open. So for those that weren't here yesterday, uh, during lockdown, we have launched a wine club in partnership with The Wine List, um, which is effectively wine tasting done over Zoom. Um, we send a box of wines uh, to your house. You get to enjoy them whilst listening to a sommelier tell us what we're tasting. Uh, it's a lot of fun. A uh, great way to have some human interaction uh, in these uh, strange times we're living through. Um, so anyone that attends six of the nine sessions um, gets an invite to the next Hacker Job Wine Club. Those of you that are on two out of two, you're a third of the way there to a couple of free bottles of wine. Um, and finally, before we jump into today's session, um, yesterday obviously we went over the product roles. Um, today we're doing a deep dive into front end development. Um, as you can see uh, there, we're going to move on to back end tomorrow and then uh, other topics towards the end of this week. We're going to focus on DevOps next week. Um, you can vote for the next course we're going to run. Um, I think artificial intelligence is leading the way at the moment, which is not a surprise. I think followed closely by more modern backend languages. So tomorrow, Phil's going to focus very much on the most popular backend languages. But we do want to do another session around some of the newer ones like Scala, Golang, Rust, um, Kotlin, etc. Uh, so you've got the link there. Um, feel free to go and vote for the, for the next course. So without further ado, jumping into today's session. Um, uh, as mentioned, today's going to be a deep dive into the world of front-end development. So um, Darren will start by giving an overview of front-ends, and that will be very high level. Um, it will recap a little bit of what we touched on yesterday, as well as talk through some of the different personas um, of a front-end developer. We're then going to go really deep into JavaScript. We've already had a couple of questions on Angular vs. AngularJS. Um, there's uh, the world of TypeScript that's, that's new um, and really challenging the, the status quo, um, which will be really interesting. We'll then jump on some recruiter insights. We've got some really cool salary data to share with you all, and that will all get sent to you afterwards. 
And finally, uh, there's a couple of challenges that people have submitted um, that we're going to discuss possible solutions for when hiring front end developers. Um, just to reiterate, all of this is being recorded um, and we will send it to you um, after the session is finished. Um, uh, if anyone didn't get a follow up email yesterday, um, if you could just drop a note to hello at hackerjob.co, we'll investigate, uh, but check your spam folders as well. Sometimes things aren't in there. So an overview of front end development, um, Darren, over to you. Um, do you want to kind of just, you know, recap what we touched on yesterday? What do we mean when we talk about uh, front end development? Cool. So essentially front end development is someone that is working on what we call the client side. So that's what you see um, as a user. So it's looking at web applications, websites, etc. And what these guys essentially will be doing, they'll be converting data into uh, graphical interfaces. So uh, think of it as, as turning design into, into code. These guys will be um, interacting with um, a couple of different teams. So they will be interacting with the backend. The backend guys will go on to in further detail tomorrow. But since they focus more on servers, databases, etc. Also a design. So think UI UX. These guys will be interacting with those guys as well. Um, so they are um, kind of middleman between between the two areas in a lot of ways. Um, so I guess the front end, like the, the second uh, bullet point says that it, it links together the world of design and technology. So I, I said this yesterday, um, but just to reiterate, what I consider to be the traditional um, uh, full and rounded uh, front end developer will be someone that's got a knowledge slash a appreciation for design as well as the tech awesome uh and again recapping a lot of what we said yesterday but yeah that look and feel of the application um front end um something that we didn't touch on um uh yesterday that is, was front end personas um mm. and i think this is really important when we look at it through the lens of actually hiring people so do you want to talk through maybe the, the three main front end personas um, that we see either companies looking for or, or candidates kind of fitting in? Yeah, sure. So um, I, we'll go into further de detail on the particular uh, HTML, CSS, etc. cetera, in, in, in the next slide, actually. But <clears throat> the three typical personas we see is someone that's design-focused, i.e. they're focusing on technologies like HTML, CSS primarily, as well as they might come from a, a design background, so like a UI, UX kind of design. So you'll see titles like, HTML developer, CSS developer, or a front end designer, um, but also doing some coding. We tend to see this a lot uh, less, um, at least within the client base we work with at the moment. The one that we see the most of is actually web focused. So this is what you can, what I consider at least, to be the kind of modern front end software engineer. So this is someone that's working with frameworks that we'll go through a little bit later in the session, like React, Angular, uh, Vue, um, that kind of stuff. Redux is a, another um, area that they kind of cover. And then you've got the computer science focused guys, which are very algorithmic focused, very mathematical, um, doing a lot of the functionality that you would consider in a lot of ways to be very back end focused rather than um, what would traditionally be more front end focused from a, like a design perspective. So um, they're the kind of freaky areas. I don't know if there's anything you'd had on your side, Phil, from a oh, talent point? Co covered it pretty well there. I think, yeah, just to reiterate, web focused um, is, is typically the most popular. I think it goes back to what I said yesterday. You know, every company in the world at the moment is trying to transform digitally. Every company in the world is trying to maximize their online presence. And with that, you know, a huge part of that is, is your website um, and the way you can serve customers using that. So um, we've had a quick question in the, in the chat just there. So uh, when it comes to web focused, um, web focused development, the modern SE that we're referring to is modern software engineering. Um, so Sorry, yes. No, 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 that's absolutely fine. So typically um, with web focused uh, development, you're using a lot of the, the modern techniques that we'll touch on in Friday's session. Um, kind of microservices, cloud development, things like that. But we'll, we'll go into a lot more depth on that on, uh, on Friday. And again, I'll, I'll go through it before you move on to the next slide. I'll go through it a little bit later in the session. But you also see with CS focused people, they might also be very proficient in what we consider, what we would call vanilla JS. 
So this is JavaScript, uh, pure code, not using any frameworks. So a couple of the clients we work with that are uh, very focused around um, technologies like GraphQL um, and very algorithmic based front end developers, they will in, in a lot of ways have vanilla JS people as a focus. Perfect. And we have had one, one question actually, um, which is, are these three personas all different? Um, so just to give my take on it, first of all, I would say they all, you know, you, you, these are quite broad categories and you absolutely mm. can be touching on design and web. Um, you absolutely can be kind of a master of algorithms, but still be working on web focused projects. So there is crossover, but if you're looking at um, JavaScript developers and the projects they're working on, you can broadly um, break the projects up into these kind of three areas. But that's absolutely not to say that someone will be absolutely exclusive to one of them. They will have crossover and, and a good developer is, you know, a well-rounded developer would have some knowledge of all three of these areas. Agreed. And I, I guess from a, uh, from a job qualification perspective, a lot of time this might help when talking to hire managers. What kind of focus are you looking for? Are you looking for someone that comes from that kind of design aspect background? So very heavy in HTML and CSS. Are you looking for someone that is uh, very framework focused? So a lot of the clients we work with, um, because of the fact that web focus straddles the line between the two, we look for someone who's got a heavy emphasis in, in React, for example. So are you looking for that kind of background? Or like I say, are you looking for more algorithmic, um, JavaScript, um, vanilla kind of coding. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Uh, really insightful intro to the, the different personas. Um, and obviously, Darren, we, we touched on this yesterday, but before we jump into to JavaScript in more depth, mm. do you want to just give a, a brief overview of the three core technologies used in, in front end development? Sure. So, uh, three uh, tech that you piece of tech you'll see mentioned over and over again when even looking at job spec or, or profile um, is HTML, CSS and JavaScript. HTML essentially is, um, it provides a general set of rules to suggest how content should look when rendered. So Bootstrap is a, um, sorry, from, from a CS perspective, Bootstrap is uh, a technology you'll see a lot and CSS is looking more at fonts, um, uh, layering and, and coloring. Uh, and then JavaScript is how you will interact with the web page. Um, so the touch and feel, interaction, scrolling buttons, interfaces, um, graphics, etc. So from that side, you will see technologies such as React, Angular, or Vue. But as we'll, we'll go through a little bit later, um, there's a lot more frameworks um, that even our list. So nice. So really, really nice intro into, into the world of front-end development. Um, I think what the, the, the technology that has exploded um, when it comes to front-end is, is JavaScript. So what we're going to spend the bulk of the, this session on is, is going through the world of JavaScript, uh, which seems to be evolving constantly. Um, but before we do that, Phil, anything else um, from the audience um, with regards to just that high-level intro into, into front-end? Not just yet. So we've still got the question on Angular um, and we've now got a question on React and Redux. But again, uh, I think we'll come on to that when we're, when we're discussing. So if Darren can introduce them um, and then we'll either go through them in the, in the explanation or I can ask them at that point. Cool. Fantastic. Sounds awesome. So diving into JavaScript in a, in a little bit more detail, Darren, do you want to um, just give us you know, a little bit more uh, insight into, into what JavaScript does? Yeah, sure. So um, JavaScript, you often see it abbreviated as, as JS. So if you see um, Vue.js or um, Meteor.js or anything like that, we're talking about JavaScript or it's coded in JavaScript. Um, JavaScript, as we'll go through in the session, is probably the most used language in the world right now because of the fact that it can be used in so many different ways. It's very much uh, almost like a, uh, a front-end background version to Python where you can use it in loads of different ways from desktop through to mobile, through to front end. And now with the introduction of Node, more backend focused stuff, um, it's an object, object oriented programming language. What essentially we're talking about when we talk about OOPs is we're talking about a programming language which organizes the software design around data or objects rather than functional uh, functions and logic. So OOPs, you're really talking about the majority of modern uh, programming languages. So anything from Python to C++ to Java, are all OOPs. 
if you're talking about non-OOP languages, you're talking about stuff like COBOL or you're talking about stuff like Pascal or C. So when you see OOP and you see that as our, cl uh, our, um, our clients or our uh, hiring managers are looking for an OOP background from a language perspective, don't be put off by that. We're just talking about modern programming languages. Um, it's designed to make web development easier and more attractive. Um, I know being in my 30s, I remember web pages from the 90s where they were really ugly, they were really hard to use, and very little happened on the page. So the introduction of languages like JavaScript in particular have meant that you can now do a lot more on pages, which is, <laughs> let's be honest, made e-commerce boom. If it wasn't for, uh, for stuff like J JavaScript, then I don't think we would have seen the takeoff of, um, of e-commerce um, as a whole. Um, and like I say, we're looking at a, a client side um, technology here. So we're looking at web behaviors. So how do you interact uh, and how do the interactions not rely to um, like server side backend stuff? Awesome. And I think to give people some more context, probably on that final point, we can do a bit of a, a history lesson on, on JavaScript because it's uh, clearly been around for a while now but perhaps only really in the last decade has, has exploded to the extent at which um, it, it's now the most used language in the world, as you said. So I think we can probably uh, chop and change between this, Daz, but m maybe you want to just talk through, you know, the early days of JavaScript um, with, with Netscape. Yeah, so um, when, you, when you think where JavaScript has come from, uh, Netscape created it, um, created it in, in 10 days, but if you look at actually when it came about, um, it's not a it's not a brand new language like a lot of people think. A lot of people think Node and think brand new and JavaScript must be brand new. Like it's been around since 1995, so very much the uh, not the early days of programming, but the early days of modern programming. JavaScript's been around since. Yeah, absolutely. And and for those that don't know um, what Netscape did, um, they effectively created the first graphical web web browser. So before Internet Explorer came along. Um, Netscape created the first web browser and, and used JavaScript um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a way of supporting that browser. A little bit of trivia, there are some rumors, they are not confirmed, that uh, the reason they called JavaScript um, JavaScript was because that Java was the most uh, popular language at the time um, and they wanted to take some of the attention away from Java. So. There is absolutely no relationship between Java and JavaScript. I think Phil's favorite analogy is it's got as much in common as car and carpet. Um, there, is, there is no relation there. Um, but then I guess moving through this timeline, um, uh, what Netscape did was effectively give JavaScript to an organization called ECMA um, to maintain and develop the language. And this all comes back to this open source ethos uh, that Phil and Darren took us through yesterday. So in 1997, ECMA started maintaining and, and building JavaScript, and that's where ECMA script uh, was born. Now you'll see uh, that abbreviated to ES5, ES6, uh, I think the latest version is like ES2019, and you'll often see this on either job descriptions or, or, um, or candidate profiles. Effectively, these are different versions of JavaScript. And with each new version, new features um, are enabled. Um, and it's the ECMA organization, um, which is an open source organization, that are setting the standards for JavaScript. Um, as we then move um, forwards, um, kind of JavaScript went into the wilderness for quite a period of time. So from 97 to, to 05, um, not much happened in the world of JavaScript. But in 2005, there was a very famous paper written which introduced the concept of AJAX. And what AJAX effectively enabled was a web browser to perform as well as a desktop application. So suddenly you could, do, um, you could store a lot more information on the client side of the web browser, which made, um, gave you a lot more potential on, on what you could actually do with it. So this started kind of the evolution of modern JavaScript and what it is today was this concept of, of Ajax. And that kind of led to its, its first framework does. Yeah, sure. So um, the, the most uh, historic, should we call it, uh, frameworks, jQuery. Um, so that came about in, um, sorry, chat popped up in 2006. 
Um, and then if we, if we take a, another step forward to 2010, you then see the introduction of single page applications, um, which is introduced by Backbone and AngularJS. What a single page application is, is think when you go onto, onto a website, um, the data doesn't all load at once. It's kind of rendered um, over, over time as you go to those pages, which makes it a lot quicker to uh to open up pages and and scroll through pages so it means a lot less going through the um server from that side and then in 2013 um there's the introduction of uh the behemoth that is react so uh react is going to come up a lot more in these um in the rest of the, the slides but essentially react is taking the crown um at least over the last few years i think there's there's some talk of um, potential in a couple of other frameworks in taking a lot of the, the market away from React, but a React right now is the, if you want to put it in football terms, they're kind of the Real Madrid of the, uh, of the JavaScript framework at the moment. Interesting. Um, uh, any, any questions, Phil, on, on, on uh, what we've done so far in terms of the evolution of JavaScript? Yeah, jumped the gun there. I was so excited by the question. So it's, it's a really interesting one because it is um, something that I think everyone kind of struggles with a little bit when they first get introduced to this. But yeah, we've got a question on what does it mean that it doesn't rely on the back end? Yeah, great question. Um, and probably something that's quite um, challenging to wrap your head around. But effectively, what um, Ajax introduced as a concept was the ability to store HTML and CSS data in the client side of the application. So effectively, as browsers became more powerful, um, you're able to store more data in the, the front end or the, the client side of the application and therefore don't rely on uh, re retrieving data from the server side as much. Now, the big benefit of this is it just means the web pages are far more interactive and load much quicker. So Ajax introduced that as a concept in in 2005 and single page applications kind of took it to the next level in 2010 whereas Darren said you suddenly have got different parts of the website loading at different times um, and that's also linked quite heavily to what Phil you're going to be talking about on Friday around um, uh, the modern software engineering piece so yeah that's that's what we talk about when we when we look at Ajax and single page applications what we mean there is HTML and CSS data is actually able to store on the client side of the, the application, not rely on the, the server side. Sorry. Any, uh, any other questions from the, the Q&A, Phil? Uh, well, we've got quite a, a tricky one. I'll throw it out there just to be good to get your opinions. What language will replace JavaScript? Um, and I know oh. it's, oh. so it's, a, it's a pretty, pretty tough one, but you um, <laughs> so, kind of heard about so, yeah, so I think there's probably um, three main, com not competitors, but languages kind of built on top of um, JavaScript, which we're going to touch on later. So the three that have probably come to the most uh, prominent recently is TypeScript, um, which we've got a whole section on, so I won't go into too much detail on now. Um, but TypeScript um, is a really, really interesting technology, and every year is becoming more and more popular with, with engineers and developers. So I think that's probably at the forefront right now, whether it will overtake JavaScript, end up compiling into JavaScript code, so it's unlikely, um, but we'll talk through that um, uh, in, in a little while. There's also two other versions called Clojure Script. Um, so Clojure is a functional programming language, uh, backend language, um, and um, my knowledge of Clojure Script isn't as good, but I believe it's trying to introduce some of those um, functional programming paradigms into the world of front end. And then a little bit of an older one is CoffeeScript. Um, so uh, again, uh, another version of a, a type of JavaScript. So I think, will anything replace JavaScript? I'm not sure, um, but TypeScript is certainly gaining in popularity and we'll dive into that in a little bit more depth um, uh, in, in a little while. But fantastic question, keeping us on our toes. Yeah. Um, cool, so we've kind of gone through the, the evolution of JavaScript. I think um, probably the biggest thing around the JavaScript community is this explosion of frameworks and probably every week we see a, a new framework created. Um, so Daz, do you want to kind of talk through, I guess, you know, remind people from yesterday, what is a, what is a framework? Um, and also, you know, you, you've got a couple here, um, you know, talk us through them. Cool. So essentially what a framework is, it's a library of, of logic. 
um, so that when a developer is starting um, a code base or starting to build something, they're not starting from scratch every time. If you didn't have a framework, essentially what you would be doing is working greenfield every time you, you start a new project. So it, think of it as a, a library, like I say, so lots of books in there. Um, within a framework perspective, I put four on here, but like I say, uh, I've got a list actually uh, in front of me. So you've got Meteor, you've got React, you've got Vue, you've got Ember, you've got uh, Backbone, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get into the complication of Angular and Angular JS. So loads of frameworks to kind of look at. Um, I've already seen a question go into, into the chat about uh, what differs between them and what makes each popular. To be honest, and I'm uh, happy to be challenged on this, but I think that a lot of it comes down to personal preference in a lot of ways between at least Angular, Vue, and, and React. Um, so Angular is great um, for, because it's, it's building fully-fledged mobile and web uh, development, so it's a framework for that, whereas React is more about UI development, um, and but it can be turned into full-fledged solutions but needs some add-ons from other libraries. And then Vue is actually gaining quite a lot of popularity among developers because it facilitates them and in also integrates into existing applications. But again, you need other libraries. So at least what I see from a, a client perspective um, is that a lot of clients are open to uh, their developers if they want React developers coming from a Vue background. And I'm seeing a lot of popularity uh, uh, in Vue um, in mainline Europe. So I know France in the last couple of years, it's been a big factor view. So um, it's interesting that it's not quite hit the same heights in the UK, but um, you, you kind of see um, that it might be gaining in the next couple of years. Awesome. And I think hopefully that answers that, that, those questions. And I think, uh, Daz, do you want to give the overview of Angular versus Angular JS? Because I think it's a, a really, really important distinction for, for people to understand. So uh, I will defer some of this back to, uh, to Phil, but uh, Angular is written in, in TypeScript, um, whereas AngularJS is written in JavaScript. So anything that's Angular 2 and above is going to be uh, Angular, so TypeScript Angular. Uh, if you see uh, Angular.js or Angular 1.5, then you're talking about JavaScript Angular. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> no need for me to get involved in that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. So, Mark, I don't know if you want to maybe take this one. So, uh, are React and Redux the same? No. Um, in, in a short answer, no. Um, so, they are often used um, uh, interchangeably, uh, or not interchangeably, sorry. They're often used together. So, you'll quite often hear that our stack is React and Redux but it's not a prerequisite. You can use Redux with other um, front-end frameworks. Um, effectively, um, Redux is a data layer. So again, talking about uh, the ability to hold more data in uh, the client side of the application, Redux supports with that. So um, you can absolutely use React without Redux. Um, just because you know React doesn't mean you know Redux and vice versa. So they are slightly different. Great. Um, and then <clears throat> one very quick question, and then another one that I'll highlight, but we're going to answer later. So uh, first of all, is it easy to learn one framework if you have experience of another? So that's actually one of the recruitment challenges or related to one of the recruitment challenges we have at the end. So we'll answer that in depth there. Um, but just very quickly, guys, what's the difference between a library and a framework in this case? Because usually when you look at the definition of Angular, React, jQuery, etc., it says they're JavaScript libraries. So maybe just a bit of clarification around the language there. Yeah, it's such a great question. And there is, I'm sure, a technical difference. So I believe um, jQuery is more of a library um, than a framework. But I think for the, for the purpose of, of this course, um, the two terms are often used interchangeably. And I think you see that a lot around tech. Um, we were talking about it yesterday with product managers and product owners. Um, you're talking about it a lot when you look at front end. Some people might be calling a job a front-end engineer, someone might call a, a job a front-end developer, someone might call a, role a JavaScript developer. They all are very similar. So um, there is, from memory, a slight technical difference um, between uh, a library and a framework. I can't recall it off the top of my head, but I think um, you will see the terms used a lot interchangeably on the web. Yeah, both, both are essentially sets of pre-existing code bases that you can use as shortcuts rather than having to code everything. From yeah. I mean, maybe a framework's more of a collection of libraries, possibly. Um, but yeah, uh, for, for the purpose of this course, I think um, using them interchangeably is fine.
Lovely. Awesome. So, um, so that frameworks, and I think, yeah, really interesting question there about um, can you switch from one to the other? Uh, we've definitely got really strong opinions on that, and I think uh, powered by our sort of dev team that, that do that regularly. Um, but we're going to cover that at the end. So, so we've touched on frameworks and, and, and their explosion. Um, Daz, do you want to maybe just talk through testing? We obviously touched on this yesterday, um, but this is more of a front-end developer doing their own testing. So mm. we want to maybe talk through what do we mean when we talk about front-end developer um, using, uh, doing their own testing, and then we'll also jump into some examples of different testing frameworks. Yeah, sure. So um, we'll be going into quite a lot of depth on this tomorrow because the whole topic tomorrow, uh, well, half the topic tomorrow is on testing with the other half being data spaces. So we'll go into a lot more depth on this. Oh, I'll probably use Thursday. I need to get my days right. Um, so essentially a testing framework is it's a set of guidelines or rules used for creating and designing test cases. Um, a word that you'll, or a phrase you'll hear quite a lot um, in modern testing is unit testing. So what a unit testing is, it's, um, it's essentially a methodology by which individual units of, of source code are tested. So um, the best analogy I have for this is that um, when you go onto Instagram, you'll have uh, a post and you'll have the amount of time since that post happened. If you were to leave the code open and do traditional tests and you change the, um, the, the file from uh, mins to mims, so a small uh, spelling mistake, that wouldn't be picked up by a, um, by a larger test case. Whereas if you're doing unit testing, you're testing very small parts of the code. So that will be picked up. So that's why uh, companies oftentimes will want developers with unit testing experience. Um, I don't know if you guys have got anything you want to add on to that. No, it's spot on. I think that's a good, good insight into unit testing. I do have a good analogy on TDD. Uh, if you want me to jump forward on that one. Well, I, I wasn't going to, but feel free, uh, Mr. Kel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just on, on TDD, obviously, so that's test-driven development, uh, which as you can see there on the screen is, is writing your tests before you then write your code, write your logic. Um, and a good way of kind of thinking about this is if you're writing a 10,000 word essay, it's kind of doing spell check as you go through it so that when you get to the end of the essay, your grammar, your punctuation, your spelling is correct, great. You're ready to submit that. <clears throat> the, the, without doing kind of TDD, you're writing the whole essay first, you're not giving a damn for spelling, punctuation, a lot. So great, you get to the end, you've got 10,000 words, but then you've got to spend however long going back through it, fixing all those little errors within your essay. Obviously, in this analogy, that's probably going to take you an hour or two. If you're a developer that's written thousands of lines of code, that could be a hell of a long time, depending on how good your code is first, first way around. So it's quite a good analogy of thinking about TDD. Phil, yeah, that is... That, that is the first time I've heard you use that analogy and it is outstanding. Uh, it's such a great way of thinking about it and also give me nightmares thinking about essays. God, it's been a while since <laughs> I've written one of those. Um, but no, awesome, awesome overview of TDD. Uh, and the final uh, methodology we have here, Daz, is, is BDD. Yeah, so BDD essentially is a, the process of being more collaborative. So uh, as we will, or I suspect, have experienced in the past, tech teams and non-tech teams are very different in terms of their approach. So what BDD does, it brings the two environments together um, and ensures when something is being deployed, it's being deployed with the consideration for the business needs. So what it should do is, uh, and it's questionable whether this always happens, but that's the, the nature of tech, um, is it should ensure that when something is deployed, it's going to meet the needs of what the business was looking for, and it's not just gone off a, on a tangent for what the uh, the tech team thought they were trying to achieve. So that's a BDD approach. Awesome. And just for those that are unsure, BDD stands for Behavioral Driven Development. Um, always abbreviated to BDD. You'll very rarely see it spelled out uh, fully. So, Daz, do you just want to talk us through, I mean, again, as there are with JavaScript frameworks, there are hundreds of JavaScript testing frameworks um, and libraries and tools, but do you want to just give us a highlight of some of the most common? Yeah, so these are the four you'll see the most. Um, Phil mentioned something to me today that I hadn't really considered, but um, it's quite obvious when you look at these. Um, a lot of the JavaScript uh, frameworks have... Uh, some uh, similarity to some coffee types that you will uh, you'll see in the, the Starbucks and, uh, and coffee markets. So uh, Mocha focused primarily on Node, 
Um, Jest is focusing more on and, and mainly on the front end frameworks. Jasmine is focusing on testing within the BDD fundamentals. And then Chai is focusing on testing within TDD fundamentals. So if you see um, these on a job spec or on a candidate CV, it gives you a bit of an indication about what uh, where the skill set needs to lie. Because if they're talking about that they're looking for a full stack developer, but they, um, they're only looking for mockers, for example, um, within a, a skill set, it shows that yes, they might be looking for a front end developer, but there's probably more focus on that back end. Awesome. And I guess where it's slightly different to the front end frameworks, a lot of the front end frameworks are kind of uh, a, a personal preference. I guess here, Daz, what we're seeing is you'll use different frameworks depending on your testing methodology. So there's actually a exactly. little bit of a difference between these frameworks, maybe versus React or a Vue. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So they're not specific to a particular framework. They're specific, can't get the word out. They're specific to a behavior or what you're looking to test. Amazing. Makes complete sense. So um phil i think uh we're going to jump on uh because i'm conscious of time uh, we've still got a few more bits and pieces to get through the, the if there was any we'll further q and a's on, on oh, we'll, go on. We'll jump in. there's been a lot of questions on bdd um that'll be covered in a hell of a lot more depth next week when we've come on to the devops stuff because it's really closely associated with a lot of those devops processes and yeah and we've got a small section on thursday as well so we'll cover up between the two Amazing. Um, cool. So we touched on this earlier. Um, and one of the most in well, I, I think generally what you see with front end and specific, specifically of JavaScript is it's one of the fastest moving areas of technology. Um, so there's a lot of innovation happening a lot of the time within the world of front end development and specifically within JavaScript. And one of the most interesting things that's happened over the last um, few years is the introduction of TypeScript. So TypeScript is its own open source programming language. So it is a separate language to JavaScript. It's got its own grammatical um, sort of flow. Um, and in programming, its own grammatical flow, uh, we call a syntax. Um, so you write code in TypeScript, but when you compile, which means when it's going actually to production and going to be uh, live, it compiles into JavaScript. So whilst it is its own programming language, it's effectively a superset of JavaScript. And a way to think about that is all valid JavaScript code would also be valid TypeScript code. So they are heavily linked, but uh, TypeScript is its own language in of itself. So now I hear you ask, why? Why have people created TypeScript? And this is now where we get very technical. Um, and to be honest, if, if you're not a developer, it's probably not going to make tons of sense. Um, I still struggle to, to completely wrap my head around it. But JavaScript, traditional JavaScript, is a dynamic programming language. So um, also known as kind of like a scripting language. So Python is, is similar in that sense. The, the way the, the syntax or the, the grammar of the language is set up means that it's a dynamic language. And what that means is that uh, a variable in JavaScript can be any data type. So in JavaScript, a variable could be a number, could be text, could be date, etc. However, in, in TypeScript, it brings, as the name suggests, a type system to the syntax, to the grammar. Um, so some other strongly typed languages would be things like Java and Scala, um, which are more back-end focused languages. And again, this is where the world of front-end and back-end uh, is forever merging. So what TypeScript has done is, is bring that, um, the, the methodology or, or the, the, the grammar of a, of a type language to JavaScript, which means when you're writing variables, you have to be very specific about the data objects you're referring to. And what this means for organizations is if you're upskilling or, or you want full stack developers, actually the syntax of TypeScript is very similar to Java or Scala or other strongly typed languages. So there's a, a, a less of a learning curve to move to TypeScript. So um, very technical as to why it's existing and, and why it's becoming more popular. Um, but I think the key thing for, for people on this call to understand is that the world of JavaScript is always evolving and TypeScript quickly becoming one of the most popular languages amongst software developers. So um, 
Is TypeScript going to replace JavaScript? Probably not because it compiles into JavaScript, but maybe more businesses will be um, writing with TypeScript. At HackerJob, we use TypeScript. A um, couple of other just very small things. Um, as Darren explained, Angular is written in TypeScript, but you can write any JavaScript framework in TypeScript. It's not unique to Angular. If you wanted to take a React and TypeScript approach, you can absolutely do so. So some very technical details on the differences between TypeScript and JavaScript, but a really interesting area of, of front-end development. And probably something we could go into uh, probably for a whole hour uh, and get some front-end devs debating on the benefits and, and cons um, of TypeScript. Um, appreciate that's been quite a deep technical review, Phil. Any, any uh, curveball questions you want to chuck at me from the audience? Or are we, are we good, good to move on? Oh, we've got nothing really specific to TypeScript. I suppose, actually, yeah, 30 seconds. If you have Angular.js, can you code in Angular? No. So Angular.js is a different framework to Angular. Um, very confusing, but basically they are almost like two different frameworks. So Angular.js uh, basically goes up to like 1.9 in terms of versions, and the main ones being Angular.js 1.0 and Angular.js 1.5. Angular 2... Um, is when the introduction of TypeScript happened and they lost the JS. So no, Angular and AngularJS, two different frameworks, and actually very different because AngularJS is written in JavaScript, Angular is written in TypeScript. Perfect. Cool. So, um, Daz, to, to chuck some confusion uh, amongst everyone, um, today we are focusing on front ends. Uh, we're diving deep into JavaScript which then leads us naturally to Node.js and backend. So do you want to give us a, a little bit of an overview of, of Node.js? Yeah, so uh, Node.js, the part I was looking most forward to, uh, the big elephant in the room when you're talking front end, but everyone goes, no, but what about Node? So Node.js uh, Node is a server side, it's a backend programming language, OOP as well. Um, so it's written in JavaScript, but you will often hear people talk about Node as a fr in, from a front end perspective. So what there actually is within Node is there's something called NPM. And NPM is a Node Package Manager, which is a compiling tool. Um, I know we kind of touched on compiling tools, but essentially what it is, it's um, a program that processes um, statements written in a particular language and then turns them into the machine language or the code, essentially. Um, Node is often used for real-time application um, such as uh, chats. So if you're going on to LinkedIn and doing chats on that, that will be written in Node, news feeds, and then web push notifications. So a lot of what you're interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis um, in a lot of roles uh, in, in the modern world will be written in Node if you're looking at uh, kind of web um, applications. Amazing. And I guess just the final piece on JavaScript, I'm just conscious of time, I want to make sure we get to the, the, the challenges people have given. Um, again, just to add a, a little bit more confusion to everyone, um, whilst JavaScript is obviously a front-end programming language, does it can be used in the, the context of mobile and, and desktop as well. Yes, yeah, so um, I'll go, go over this quickly. If people have further questions, please do let us know. But essentially, like Mark said, it can be used in both mobile and desktop. So from a mobile perspective, um, you have what we call native languages and, and hybrid languages. So a native language for Android, for example, would be Kotlin, and then for iOS, it would be Swift. Um, so these languages we've got on here are all hybrid. So they can be used across Android and with iOS. So there's React Native, I Ionic, and Cordova. Um, so they're all hybrid languages, but also from a desktop perspective, there's uh, an open source framework called Electron. Electron is huge in the modern space. So when you think about the applications you interact with on a daily basis on your laptop, so uh, I personally got uh, WhatsApp um, web on my, uh, on my laptop. Um, I've got Zoom on my laptop. I've got Slack on my laptop. All of these are written in, in Electron or using the Electron framework. So you'll be interacting with, um, with desktop applications a lot that are written in JavaScript. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you, Daz. And I think, yeah, as a, as a, as a bit of a summary before we jump into those recruitment insights. So, you know, key front end technologies, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. Um, we've got those three different personas. So you've got your more design focused front end developers with a bit more of a steel on HTML and CSS. 
You've got your sort of web-focused front-end developers, and that's using a lot of the technologies we've talked about today. So React, Redux, TypeScript, Webpack, etc. And then you've got those real core computer science-focused uh, front-end devs. They might be using Vanilla JS um, or solving, you know, potentially harder computer science problems. Um, and you know, as you've seen, the world of JavaScript is just evolving at such pace. So yes, it is predominantly used in the front-end world uh, with those. Uh, front end frameworks we touched on, but as we've covered there at the back end, uh, you know, we, we can use it in, an, in a context of Node.js, which Phil is going to touch tomorrow as a back end language or as, uh, as mobile or, or desktop languages as well. So, really versatile language, absolutely no surprise that it's, you know, the most used uh, language in the world given how many different use cases it's got. Um, so I'm conscious of time. What we'll do um, is these recruiter insights, basically what we've got for you, you guys watching is some salary data and some data around um, the key skills. I think, you know, we're going to share the, this with you afterwards. And I think it's much more interesting to jump into some of the challenges that were given to us. So we'll share the slides with you. You'll get all of this insight into, you know, what we're seeing in the market across the UK. But I think um, given that we've only got 10 minutes left, I think, you know, really keen to spend a bit of time on these um, challenges that some of you have submitted. We've made them anonymous um, around the world of front end and hiring in front end. So um, the first one, I think Daz and Phil, maybe Daz, if you want to give a give a first crack at this, um, we got given, which I know we debate constantly internally, um, but someone said, my hiring manager is asking for two years commercial experience with React. Is this realistic? Jazz, do you want to kind of give us your, your first take? Uh, well, as we saw earlier in the slides, React has been long enough, uh, around long enough to be realistic. But I think when, when I'm looking at realistic, I'm looking at the, uh, almost like um, equilibrium. So we're talking about economic um, methodologies here. So supply versus demand. And within the market right now, there's so much demand for React, the supply can't catch up with it in terms of everyone is looking for two to three years React. So in reality, what you should be challenging your hiring managers on um, is, okay, why do we need two years of React? What do you, we think the developers will gain from going from six months experience in, in the framework and getting the fundamentals to going to two years? Like, What is the extra gain in that period? And um, challenge them on, okay, people that are in the team right now that have got two years experience, how much do they think they gained in that period? Because the um, the reality is because everyone's hiring for it, candidates have got a lot of options right now. So the more open you um, make your um, your search and the more you will be open to utilizing uh, tools like Vue that, like I said, a lot of clients are open to going across, the easier you're going to make it for yourselves. Hopefully that answers the question. Nice. Awesome. And Phil, do you want to give maybe some context from the talent side or, or what you're seeing? Yeah, yeah, 100%. So, yeah, to reiterate what Darren's saying, absolutely you can hire people with two years React. There's people with, with, with uh, a lot more than that on the market these days. Uh, but I think you have to, to, to factor in, one, how many do you want to hire? Because hiring one or two with two years React, yeah, fine. Hiring 20 or 30, if you look at the build out full teams, that's when it is going to delay your hiring if you're not going to compromise at all. So what you have to factor in is how much is our business going to lose out by not hiring these people in the short term? So if it takes you two months to fill a team where, yes, some have more than two years React experience, some might have a year and a half, some might only have six months, but they're a really talented developer and you see a lot of other things that you like in their past, you know, in, the, in their history. Having that team full within two months, how much money will you generate rather than waiting for, say, six months to fill that entire team with people that have, you know, over two years experience? I mean, not only is there the fact that that four months probably pushes some of the ones you have hired over that two year threshold anyway. Um, but yeah, you have to factor that in. How much, how much will we make by ha making these hires now rather than in a month, two months, three months, if we're going to be that narrow. Um, and then I think the second thing to bear in mind is what are the kind of bells and whistles do you want on this, this developer? If you're talking about hiring, you know, four or five react developers with at least two years experience in central London, and that's basically all you're looking for. Yeah, you probably won't have too much of a challenge. If you want them to be commutable to your office and you know, you're not necessarily in central London or you're looking for a certain commercial background, maybe from a certain industry or not from a contract background or whatever it is, the more of these that you add on, then yes, it does get trickier. And at that point, if all of those other factors are super, super important, then you probably do have to look at 
being a bit more flexible with the React experience that you're looking for. So um, you have to look at it case by case. There will absolutely be some instances where you do have to hire someone with two years experience, but certainly not as many as, as we see. Yeah, and I think just to get my two cents on this, I guess two key points is, um, I remember speaking to a CTO many years ago now, and it's always stuck with me, is using years of experience as a yardstick can be quite damaging in the sense that it matters more what the person's been doing for that period of time rather than how long they've been using it. So, you know, if they've been working on a small project for two years, they probably don't have the depth and breadth of somebody that's worked on four or five different projects over a year using React. Um, and that applies to, to any role. Um, I would really steer clear of years of experience and actually understand what, what do we want them to have done with React. Um, and I think secondly, kind of, you know, our core philosophy around hiring is, you know, um, if you hire smart, passionate people that are willing to learn, it's not too difficult to transition from a Vue to a React or, or an Angular to a React or vice versa. The team at HackerJob do it constantly. You know, our team have moved from PHP to Go recently. Um, on the front end, we've got some applications written in Angular and TypeScript. Our new website's going to be written in React by the same devs. And, and a lot of that's just that hunger to, to self-learn and, and, and teach themselves. So I would always challenge teams to, to work out, one, what it, what's the actual experience you need, not years of experience, but what have they done? And two, what's, you know, how are you assessing these people? Why are you hiring for sort of attitude and, and fit rather than a, a specific skill? Um, Phil, maybe we'll just go to you on this final one, just we wrap up for one o'clock. Um, Ken says all the time. So uh, we currently send out a take-home tech test for front-end roles, but have a very low completion rate, around 20%. Is this normal? Um, just for those that aren't aware, a take-home technical test basically means a test that you send to a candidate, they complete it in their own time, they can spend as long or as short on it as they like, uh, and then they send it back to you. Uh, Phil, do you want to give kind of your insight from a candidate perspective on this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think the first thing you have to bear in mind is that candidates are time strained. I know at the moment we're all kind of living in this weird lockdown world, so perhaps doesn't quite apply right now. Um, but when we get back to normal, what you've got to bear in mind is that these people have, you know, eight, nine hour day jobs, typically commuting probably two hours a day. That's, you know, 11, 12 hour, hours every day just there. If you've got a family, if you've got, you know, things going on at home, realistically, you're not going to have two, three, four hours in the evening to sit down and do a test, no matter how much you like a company. Yes, you may be able to do it on a weekend, but again, we all know, you know what, what it's like. We're busy people, you've got birthdays, you've got all these other things going on. Um, again, it, it could be that you can't do it that weekend, it's going to be the next, next weekend, which, fair enough, that's only one weekend away. But if you send a tech test in that first week, that's two weeks till you're getting it back to review it, which is huge. Like You, you guys have all been recruiters, um, or our recruiters, sorry, you know that time and, and speed is absolutely crucial in making a hire, that two weeks is far, far too long. That's without even thinking about the other processes that are involved in. So yeah, you've got the Matech test. What if two or three other companies have the Matech test? What if one of those companies is one of the big four or um, 10 minutes from their house? So, so there are a lot of different factors within this that can really slow down your recruitment. One thing you can do, obviously, is be selling your company in right from the start. So make sure they are, they are bought in, they are keen when you're proposing the tech test to them, try and set a deadline with them at that point and make sure that, you know, you, you put clear timeframes um, in mind. I think one of the things that is a bit of a pet peeve of mine is when companies say, ah, oh, just get us it back whenever, because that is license for the candidate to take. Agreed. As, <laughs> as, long as, as long as they would like to, to get that done. Um, but no, my, my, my advice, to be honest, would be to avoid long uh, take-home technical tests. I think... A short, short take-home test, so an hour, two hours absolute max is fine. Do that in, your, in the middle of your process to try and whittle down uh, you know, your applicants to the ones that really do have your, your core skills. But rather than doing a four-hour test, extend your face-to-face -face interview by an hour and do a, a pair programming assignment and actually get them in the office and sit them next to one of your developers and do it in an interactive way. You're still getting them to do the same challenge. You're still technic technically testing them. In fact, you could do it twice without giving them a four, I mean, we've seen eight hour tests. I mean, how, how many of you, you know, have eight hours free on a, on a weekend typically without having to cancel something? Probably quite rare. Um, so yeah, my advice would be to, uh, to try and get the buy-in to really sort of make sure that they are committed if you have to do them, but if possible, try and avoid it 
try and give them a short test and then try and build some pair programming into your face-to-face. -face. You'll get way better engagement and you'll get people through the process way, way quicker. Absolutely. And I think Phil, thanks to build on there is obviously remote pair programming is becoming more and more popular given the situation. You know, we've just built a tool that enables that. So actually getting an hour between the candidate and one of your devs and, and remote pairing remotely or pair programming remotely, should I say, uh, is another great way to avoid the, the dreaded eight hour take home test. Yeah. Um, awesome. So um, as, as uh, that kind of brings us to a uh, conclusion for today, bang on time, I must add. Um, today's quiz, uh, another 10 questions uh, in 10 minutes. Um, no cheating, as Darren said yesterday. Um, uh, hopefully a little bit harder than yesterday's um, is there. Um, I think a big thank you to Daz and Phil for your contributions today. Hopefully that was a, a really interesting session into the world of front end and really focusing on that crazy world of JavaScript that can be used in so many different ways. Um, tomorrow's session, we're gonna go into backend development. Um, actually, Silvio, one of our senior software engineers at HackerJob is gonna be joining that. Um, he's one of the, the, the engineers that's just transitioned from PHP to Go. Um, so he'll be giving his take on, on life as a backend dev. Um, there will be new Zoom details sent to you this afternoon, so please log into that. And if you, if you guys are finding this uh, valuable, we'd really, really appreciate it if you could share it with your wider team. So uh, a big thank you for tuning in today. Uh, we'll follow up this afternoon with all of the content. Uh, I'm really excited to, to see you here again tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. guys. Again, I've got to work out how to uh, end a broadcast, but thank you so much for everyone joining, guys. Cool, cool, cool. Bottom right, man. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just seeing if anyone else pops up with any other questions that they want us to dive into.